suit up, putting on the whole armor of God. We're going to be talking about the helmet of salvation today. But before we get to that, I have a couple of things to remind the congregation about. The first thing is, is that there is going to be a town hall meeting about some new and exciting things going on in atonement. Uh, Pastor Mark is going to be leading that meeting. It's going to, uh, it, actually there was one going on during this time, uh, but there'll be a second one for this service. It will be in the uh, sanctuary. So if you would like to kind of grab a cup of coffee, head to the sanctuary, uh, some neat stuff, particularly about a, one congregation that we're looking to partner with. We're very excited about that. So uh, uh, you want to poke your head in there and uh, uh, take a listen. Pastor Mark's got some great stuff to share with that regard. Uh, the second thing is this. Uh, uh, you're not going to be seeing me for a couple of weeks. Uh, I had a wonderful time with the executive board uh, this last Tuesday uh, talking about uh, me carrying a little bit too much uh, uh, leave, uh, carrying it over and carrying it over and not taking it. And they uh, very lovingly uh, encouraged me to say, you know, pastor, you need to practice what you preach about Sabbath. Uh, they did say they were in love. It was in love. And so uh, next week, uh, uh, Pastor DJ will be bringing the final message in the suit up. Take a good look. This is the last time you will see me in a suit. For those of you who have been cheering that on, uh, for those of you who have been desperately longing for the sweaters, you will see that again on November 28th. It'll be a blue sweater that will bring out the blue in my eyes, just again to let you know that. But uh, uh, that, that's on the 31st. That's also a confirmation. Uh, the, the pastoral staff will be there with uh, Becky and, and Mark and DJ, but also our youth groups, uh, our youth people are, are uh, Jen and Ryan, a great confirmation service at 2 o'clock next, next Sunday. Also, I uh, want you to know that uh, on the 7th, uh, Pastor Mark will be bringing a message, and you'll want to be a part of that. Uh, you'll want to not miss that. Uh, then on the 14th, some really exciting stuff happens. On the 14th, we are having a mission festival here. We're partnering again. We We've been previously partners with World Mission Prayer League, uh, an um, independent Lutheran organization that uh, sends missionaries throughout the world through prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, they're going to be uh, hosting a mission festival here. It has something to do with the congregation that we're going to be uh, kind of partnering with. And so you'll want to be a part of that. It'll be a great time. Uh, uh, the director of World Mission Prayer League, whose name escaped me right this minute. Uh, I, the old one was Chuck Lindquist, but I, I know that's not the person who is now. So Paul, I know your first name is Paul, but I, it escapes me right now. But he'll be preaching. He'll be bringing a message. And there's going to be quite the festival for that. Uh, then following that, the next Sunday, the 21st of November, will be our Grow One spirit, uh, Spiritual Stewardship Appeal. Uh, we, in times past, we've done Consecration Sunday. Uh, still a little bit... Uh, you know, concerned about getting large, large crowds of people together, uh, but also the food and so forth. So we're simply doing what's called a Grow One Stewardship Sunday. Our, our, our good friend and former member of this congregation, we kind of adopted him as a member of our staff, uh, Pastor Tom Olson will be uh, leading that message. Uh, Pastor Tom's an amazing guy. Uh, he's going to be going out as a missionary for World Mission Prayer League. So just encourage you uh, in that regard. So there's a lot that's going on. I'll be back uh, on the 28th uh, of November, uh, our sermon series then is going to be, What Child Is This? You know, every year we sing that hymn, and we just kind of pass right on by. Well, what child is this? We need to stop and think about what child is this that we worship during the Advent and Christmas season. So just want to let you know that, and uh, uh, God bless you all. But again, take one last look at the suit because it's going back in the closet as soon as I leave here today. So uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would send forth your spirit today. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by your Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ Jesus our Lord and all God's saints said, amen. Gather friends, may grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus who is the Christ. Amen. The helmet of salvation. Somewhere along the line in human history, somebody got the idea that we needed to protect our noggins. Now, from God's perspective, our noggins were pretty well protected as it was. I mean, think of it. I mean, and as far as bones go, our skull's a pretty thick thing. I mean, for some of us, we've got thicker skulls than others. 
But nevertheless, our noggins are pretty much intact. But it's the activities that we do that need a little bit more protection for our noggins. Somewhere along the line, somebody got the idea to, to, to wrap a noggin in, in extra leather, make a helmet out of that, or, or, or wrap it in metal. That, that might be a better even idea. Or stick the, the leather inside the metal so the metal wasn't so uh, chafy and uh, then it'd be fine. And when, you know, guys would go out and break things and kill people or kill people and break things or whatever they did in war, they decided, well, you know, um, I need to protect my noggin. And so they built these fancy, fancy helmets for protecting their noggins. Uh, and uh, over time, uh, you know, these uh, noggin protectors got uh, uh, more and more elaborate. Some people got the idea, well, I can't just protect my noggin, I got to protect my face. I got to protect my face. So they put a face protector on their noggin protector, their helmet. And this would, their helmet would have this face piece. And then somebody got the idea somewhere along the line that if I made a really ferocious design on the front of my face uh, piece, it might scare folks or kind of let people know just how bad to the bone I really am. So they would put all these things on their face piece and, and uh, try to make themselves look, uh, you know, really uh, evil and, 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 and terrifying. Then, then, then the boss, the king, got the idea and says, well, why is my, my noggin protector different from their noggin protector? My noggin protector should be really nice. So I want my noggin protector to be decorated with gold and, and, and silver and jewels and so people know how special I am and how special my noggin is. And hence we got crowns. That's kind of how that came up. Just like we got scepters from war clubs because the king wanted a fancy, fancy war club. Well, over time, uh, you know, uh, humanity evolves, and finally we get OSHA. <laughs> and OSHA pretty much says, you got to have that noggin protected, and here are the ways that that noggin's got to be protected. You need a hard hat, you need this, you need that. You need all sorts of things that protect your noggin in, uh, at work. And we have all manner of things. Uh, then then uh, uh, sports, you know, you, you need noggin protection in sports. It is interesting how Little League baseball had noggin protection before Major League Baseball really was serious about it. Did you realize the last guy not to wear noggin protection at plate in Major League Baseball did so in 1979? That's kind of crazy to think about, that someone is hurling this hard, uh, hard sphere at my head at maybe 90 miles an hour, and I'm going to sit there and let not protect my noggin? you out of your mind. And, you know, um, more noggin protection. You know, in, in football, you know, they didn't always wear noggin protection in football. But nevertheless, noggin protection is a very important thing. You need your noggin protected no matter what you're doing. Now, you know, you can't conceive of somebody even riding a bike without noggin protection, also known as a helmet. Makes sense. No one's fighting you today on wearing a helmet. If you're going to wear a helmet in baseball, football, hockey, you name it, on your bike, you're going to be wearing noggin protection. You're going to be putting on the helmet. It's the helmet of salvation that we're talking about today, though. It says, take up the helmet of salvation. I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Uh, I really like the, the, the last three. I really like the idea of the, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. These, are, these ones get me really excited, uh, particularly. But this one, it says, take up the helmet of salvation. Now, understand that, uh, you know, we're church. Salvation is one of those words that we use a lot, and we hope everybody understands what salvation means. But you can't really be uh, too sure about it. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a rather heady, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, heady description of what salvation is. Uh, listen up to this. Salvation has to do with deliverance, being delivered from some type of danger or peril. In Scripture, the primary peril in question has to do with the penalty and power of sin. We get that. You've been getting good teaching. I look out at you and know you guys, and I know that you've been getting good Bible teaching about what salvation is and how 
that we are delivered from peril. Now, as I said, in Scripture, it's generally the power and penalty of sin. That's what it means to be saved. Now, you could be saved in many other ways. You know, you hear about people being saved from the flood waters. You hear about people being saved from a burning building. You hear about all kinds of, of ways that people are being saved, but we're talking about being saved from the power of sin. Now, what's that look like? Thus, salvation speaks of being delivered from all rebellion, defiance, and disobedience against God, as well as being delivered from a state of unbelief and the denial of God's and his rule in our lives. Again, that is awfully academic. Wouldn't you say? I think it is. I mean, I'm kind of an academic kind of guy, and I think that's awfully academic. But I think it's also spot on because we've got to unpack that a little bit. I mean, this really is what everybody... You, me, all of us are in some sort of peril. And spiritual peril is kind of top of the list. Now, sometimes it's hard to see that spiritual peril. You know, if, if you're leading a life of, of, of wretchedness or, or either moral wretchedness or physical wretchedness or just difficult situations, it becomes very obvious what you need to be rescued from. It's very obvious what you need to be saved from. Again, some people, it, they don't need to, to, to have a lesson on salvation. They know the peril they're in. But when you live in 58104... Life can be pretty good. Uh, that also goes for 56560 too, by the way, just to let you all know, if you happen to cross the river. I know the zip code there. Here's the problem. When life's good, it's hard to recognize our, what it is that we need to be delivered from. When life's good, it's hard to recognize what we need to be saved from. When life's good, we tend to think that we don't need salvation. And then we kind of fall into this latter group right here, uh, a state of unbelief and the denial of God and his rule in our lives. Hey, I'm doing a great job. I'm ruling my life pretty well. Have you seen the digs I'm in? Life is good. You've seen my ride. Life is good. You know, what do I need to be saved from? Uh, you need to be saved from yourself, friend. You need to be saved from your pride. You need to be saved from your arrogance. You need to be saved from your selfishness. These are the things that in an affluent society we need to be saved from. This isn't the first time in history a society has been ridiculously affluent. It's even Bible times. Now, not, not the New Testament, mind you. I mean, in the New Testament times, there were incredibly affluent people. They just weren't living in Jerusalem. They were living in Rome. And there was a guy, he was a pagan, he was a philosopher, a poet. His name was Juvenal. And uh, he observed Roman society and he saw uh, that it was pretty decadent and people kind of living on their own. And Juvenal wrote this wonderful line, I love it. He said this. He said, luxury is more brutal than war. Luxury is more brutal than war. Think about that and what that means. Think about how our lives of affluence, our lives of ease can certainly deceive us into thinking that we've got it made and we have nothing from which to be saved. How wrong can we be? We need to be delivered from all rebellion, all defiance, and all disobedience against God. Do I, do I need to preach a sermon on stubbornness again by any chance? That, by the way, is a sin. And yet we cherish that sin. That's included in all rebellion, disobedience, and defiance. Anything that would set itself up against God as a God in our lives, we need to be delivered from. Well, let's get on with it. Let's get to the Bible. Let's, let, you know, let, let's, you know, people like to say, you know, uh, I, I, that, that's from your head, you need it in your heart. Please, whatever you do, if you hurt my head, you know what's going to happen? My heart's going to die too. If you hurt my heart, my head's going to die. I'm one thing. So, you know, it's the whole thing. You need, it, you need it both. Uh, don't, don't talk to me, well, that's head knowledge and you need heart knowledge. I, you need them both, okay? You need them both. And what better one could there be for heart knowledge than this one? We all love this passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, why do we stop there? The best part's next. 
Here's what the best part says. Uh, next part says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You know, I am tired of Christian people or people calling themselves Christian who just excel in condemnation. You know, I really am. I am fed up with Christians who absolutely excel in condemnation. Condemning everything but themselves, of course. Now, I'm against sin. I vote that sin is bad. And we should condemn sin. I'm all on board with condemning sin. But, God, but you know, that's not the message. For God did not send his son in the world. Jesus didn't come in the world to condemn the world. Friends, that job had already been done by us. We have already done a fine job of condemning us and the world. We've done a perfect job. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's the Jesus thing, friends. It is about deliverance. The purpose of Jesus to come into the world is to bring the message of hope and deliverance to people who are living in the peril, in the, in the pain, in the suffering of leading a life that is so self-centered or leading a life that is so oppressed. Jesus come to save us, friends. You need to understand that. And we need a lot of saving that's going on. You know, I, I really don't need to do this. I, you know, there, we, we could just say, you know, uh, we kind of sort of ask for a show of hands. Uh, those people who are really into uh, 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 greed, y'all go over there. Uh, those people who are into anger, y'all over there. Those people who are into lust, y'all go over there. Those people who are just plain lazy, y'all go over there. Those people who are indifferent, y'all go over there. The problem is, you know, I wouldn't know which way to go. Where am I going to go? I could fit in any of them. And I think we all could. God came to save me from that. God came to deliver me because of Jesus. Because he loves me. And sometimes we forget that. But that's what this is. You know, if it's in your heart, you need to get that message to your head. You know, sometimes people say, well, you got to get that message down to your heart. Well, sometimes you got to get the message to your head, too. Your head's important. That's why they make helmets, by the way. goes on to say this. Um, this message of Jesus got uncorked and, and got spread everywhere. And uh, as it got cork, uncorked and spread everywhere, holy cow, all kinds of crazy stuff was happening. And the apostles started spreading it. And one of the apostles, a guy by the name of Peter, he, he decides to, 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 to do the stuff that Jesus did. He actually decides, isn't this crazy? He actually took Jesus at his word. Jesus said, greater things you will do. And you know what Peter did? Greater things. Not because he was Peter. I mean, you know, we all know, we all know what kind of guy Peter is. And it's not Peter that's doing this. It's Peter trusting in Jesus. Peter using the Holy Spirit. Peter being led by the Spirit. Peter acting out in faith. That's what's going on. And so he goes around healing people. He goes around t telling Jesus, uh, telling the word of Jesus to people. He goes around doing the Jesus thing to people. And uh, the religious people are none too happy with this. This is not how we do it at this church. You forgot to use the order, proper order of service. And then uh, the religious people sort of uh, put Peter on trial. And Peter says this. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. And there is no one else in, there's no salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other name by which people must be saved. This upsets people sometimes because they're still living in the rebellion against God. People will say sometimes, and maybe you said it or maybe someone said it to you, well, you know, there are many paths to God. Well, you've heard me say that before, haven't you? There are not many paths to God. There are, in fact, many dead ends to God. Only one path. We as people have created all sorts of goofy ideas on how we get right before God or how we get right before ourselves, and they're precisely that. They are unbelievably goofy ideas. 
They're terrible. None of them work. They're harebrained schemes. They're unbelievably harebrained. And yet, we keep coming up with them and keep trying to say, well, we've got another way to go. There is, no, however, no other way to go. There's no other name by which we must be saved. It's Jesus, friends. The answer is pretty simple. The answer is pretty simple. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I know you've gotten good teaching, and I do know that you know the answer is Jesus. That is a good thing that you know that, and I want you to know that because it's got to be in our heart and in our head, both places. And I know that you've been taught, and rightly so, that we are saved by grace through faith, and this is none of our doing. It's God's idea. Amen. I sign on to that. I raise my hand and say, hallelujah, that's true. But does that mean we do nothing? Let's take a look about this. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, uh, they're out doing the evangelistic thing. They're going out the missionary thing. They're going doing their stuff. And Paul and Barnabas are out speaking uh, to a religious group. And, uh, uh, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. You know, let's face it. I mean, uh, if I was going to start a, uh, a, 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 a Bible teaching campaign, I think I'd go to people who at least have some respect for the Bible. At least we're open to hear what I might have to say. At least start there, you know, maybe get some little success, build some momentum and get things going. Well, that's kind of how Paul and Barnabas were doing it. But it wasn't going so great because the people said, you know, hey, we've never done it that way before. There must have been Lutherans in the first century. Never can tell. Uh, uh, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Guess what? Paul's telling the religious people of his day. Paul's telling the children of Abraham, the children of Israel, who think that they have an absolute monopoly on God. It ain't so. That salvation is for all people. For the Lord has commanded us, saying, and this quote, by the way, is from Isaiah, Isaiah 46. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It is true that we do nothing to be saved. It is absolutely true that we do nothing to be saved. But it is not true that we do nothing about salvation. It is our job as the church of Jesus Christ, it is our job as individual members of the body of Christ to do this very thing, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, the ends of the earth might start here in Fargo. You never can tell. I mean, let me tell you something. Uh, uh, from where Paul and Barnabas were sitting, uh, Fargo was the ends of the earth. They had no idea it even existed. But there were still people here that needed to hear the gospel. And there's still people throughout the world who need to hear the gospel of salvation. There's no getting around it. Such is salvation. We're all in need of it. But what about that noggin protector? What about that noggin protector? How's that working for us? It says that we're to put on the helmet of salvation. The first mention of helmet in the Bible takes place here. The story of David and Goliath. Why do we give this story to kids to read? Don't you know that people die in this story? You know, I, quick, quick story. Uh, my son, Mark, you, I love my son, Mark. He's a great kid. But when he was 10 years old and I was serving a church in, in Savage, Minnesota, he comes out, we're, we're, we're sitting around, he comes in the sanctuary, just Rhonda and I, and he throws, he's got a hand, claw hammer in his hand. He throws it up in the air and grabs it by the handle. Throws it up in the air and grabs it by the handle. Throws it up in the air and grabs it by the handle. And he comes to me and said, Dad, does the church have insurance? <laughs> now, you know, <clears throat> There are, there are points in my life that I want to see my son with a hammer in his hand doing work with it. But, you know, there are other times when I see him throwing it up in the air like that, I'm nervous. You know, if one of your kids happens to have a slingshot, you're, you're nervous immediately, particularly if they're unsupervised. Why do we tell kids this story? Every kid knows it, though. Nevertheless, the, 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 the bigger part of the story we miss. We all focus on the slingshot thing. The bigger part of the story we miss, though, because Saul, who's the king, sees that David wants to go out to fight Goliath, who is this monstrous tall giant who has got all sorts of gnarly armor and the first mention of a helmet. And Saul gets the idea, says, here, David, 
why don't you put my armor on because you'll need it. Boy, will you need it. But there was a problem. It didn't fit him. So many of us try to go out into battle with somebody else's armor instead of the one that was designed for you. So many of us try to rely on somebody else's faith instead of the faith that God wants to put in your heart. Because David was armed. Believe me, David was armed. Yes, he only had a sling and five smooth stones when he went out in battle. But he had something else. He had spiritual armor on, which was like no other. He had the armor of God about him because he had faith. Ironically, and the ironic part of the story of uh, David and Goliath is that even though Goliath is so heavily armed and so heavily protected, and it even specifically mentions that he has a helmet, how does he die? He dies by a blow to the head with one of those stones from David's sling. How ironic. There's another account in the Old Testament about helmets and so forth. They're not mentioned as much as shields are, but this is another one. Uh, This is from Isaiah, Isaiah 59, verse 17. You know, it's funny. I've been through the Bible a few times, a couple times since I was 14 years old. And I've taught on this particular passage several, several times. But I never noticed this before. I had noticed that Paul, when he's talking about the whole armor of God, is heavily borrowing from Isaiah's prophecy here. Isaiah is speaking to a time when the people of God have uh, uh, rejected him. And God needs to go into battle himself. And he says, he put on righteousness. The he there is God. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Sounds very much like the whole armor of God, doesn't it? That's where Paul got the idea from. But the more I studied this, the more I drilled down, I came across this week something that I'd never seen before. I just thought, you know, I, 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 I'd always looked at, you know, Ephesians and Ephesians Paul wrote in Greek and I looked at the Greek language and all that sort of stuff. I don't want to bore you with any of that stuff. But this week I thought, geez, I wonder what that Hebrew word for salvation is. And so I, I looked it up and I was so pleasantly stunned it wasn't funny. You know, I've been telling you and telling people about this idea of putting on the whole armor of God. You know, we're we're to put on truth. Well, who is the truth? Who's the way, the truth, and the life? Uh, We're to put on righteousness. Who is the one that makes us righteous? We're to put on uh, uh, peace. Well, who is the prince of peace? Uh, We're to put on faith. I mean, who do we have faith in? We're to put on salvation. Who brings about salvation? Uh, The Spirit, or the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Who is the living Word of God? Well, the answer is Jesus, friends. Here's the amazing thing. When we put on the whole armor of God, we look like Jesus to the enemy. It's as if that faceplate is inscribed with a different face, not our own the face of Jesus. But then I clicked and, 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 and looked up this word for salvation in the Old Testament, the helmet of salvation. And there, to my amazement, was a word of which I'm very familiar. Yeshua. You may have heard that name Yeshua before. It's the name that Mary gave her son, only in Hebrew, not in Greek. Yeshua is the name of Jesus. Jesus means salvation. We are to put on the helmet of Jesus. As we go into battle against the evil one, what the evil one sees is not us, but sees the face of Christ on our helmet. The face of Christ engraved on that face plate of the helmet. The face of Christ, the face of the victor. The face of the one who brings us victory in Jesus. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, give us this armor today. Help us to put on this helmet and remind us of this great and precious salvation, so precious that the prophets prophesied that the apostles preached and the angels so earnestly desired to see it. Help us to be every bit as earnest about that salvation and us to put it on that we might advance your kingdom. For we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's saints said, amen.